Let's uh, turn our microphones on, please, so everyone can shout at us, uh, hear us. It's Tough. just about time, huh? Good evening, everyone. We're going to start this meeting at 5.01. Um, let me get back to my agenda. I just called this to order, so let's do the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready to begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you um, for coming. Um, let's see, we have uh, a couple of changes. There's the mayor. Uh, I was just about to report him missing and send out a posse. Um, let's see, the chair, Dan Breen, couldn't make it tonight, so his alternate, Peter Thielke, is, is sitting in. And apparently, um, Jim couldn't make it either, so we have you. Emily. Emily. <laughs> Emily's here. Jim and, went to Wyoming to experience cold. Oh, wow. Is he going to be all right? God, Emily. Okay, uh, the th item three on the um, agenda is director announcements and reports. Uh, first of all, uh, mutuals, and you can cut some slack because you were just told about this, right? Uh, actually, um, a couple days ago. Okay, do you have anything to report? Um, just a little brief announcement about Senior Canyon. We are still, uh, um, working on getting power to our new wells, and we've had a little bit of breakthrough with Edison, so that's good news. So hopefully in the next month or so, we'll have the power we need to take the process to completion and start pumping those two new wells. Well, that's great. Yeah. Give us a report on how much water you find. All right, um, Ojai Water Conservation District, Emily. Um, I brought, we have several openings on our board, and I brought the flyer on the table there. I have a couple more here. Um, if anyone's interested, uh, board members must live in the district, which is kind of an oddly shaped district in the east end. Does not include all the way up to Thatcher School, does not include Hermitage Ranch area, and it basically goes down to about Gridley Road, Bocales. Um So anyway, there are some openings on our board for this upcoming election, and there's more information on the flyer. If anyone needs more, it's on the um, website as well. So. So there's no chance of drafting Roger Essick because uh, it goes doesn't yeah. go up that far, right? Yeah, you have to own property in the district. You do not need to live in the district, but you must own property in the district. Okay, sorry, Roger. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you can buy my property. Anyway, I think I mean we have interested parties. I think we'll be able to fill the seats, but I just thought I'd announce it. At oh, this that's a good announcement. Yes, Thank you. Interested. Uh, City of Ohio, anything, Johnny? Nothing from the city. Uh, Casitas Municipal Water District Lake level. Okay, you ready? Mm -hmm. The it's at 32.4 percent full, and it's come up about five feet. Uh, the lake level is at 485.1. Uh, at the um, um, what do you call it? The Elevation. elevation. No, it's the elevation, yeah, but it's above sea, sea level. Uh, okay, so that means we've got 77,093 acre feet left in the lake. And it's water still pouring in. 
um, Community Facilities District. Uh, Richard, do you have anything? No, I don't have anything. Okay. Yes. Yes. Item three, the bottom two squares. That's the warm well and the mutual number six. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, our Gorham well went down uh, yesterday, so it's not working. Um, it will be worked on and it will be working again. Anything else to add to director announcement or reports? Nope. It's all right. Um, director comments, anything anyone wants to add here? Item four. Seeing none, we've got basin status reports. We've titled today's presentation The Basin Status uh, Midwinter's Tale. It's uh, because we're literally in the middle of winter. Uh, thank you, CC. <coughs> what that means is that, you know, what you're about to hear is, uh, is, is exactly, um, let's see, we're about a third of the way through, which if the first third of winter bodes well, the second two-thirds should be fairly decent as well. So today we're going to talk about precipitation uh, and the groundwater response to that precipitation and stream flow. So these are the, the key components of, of the basin balance here. And I wanted to start with the precipitation. So uh, as of 10 a.m. this morning, uh, in the two gauges that we look at the most closely, the valley floor, we had uh, nine 0.57 inches of, of rain for the year. That's since October 1st. Up on the ridge, uh, at Nordhoff Ridge, uh, 20.32 inches. And that's uh, obviously more than double the, the valley floor capacity. But uh, it's, it's interesting because much of that uh, orographic effect was realized in some of the earlier storms. The later storms, this one, uh, very similar precipitation totals at low elevation versus what we see at, at higher elevation. So it'll be interesting to see how as the, the cooler storms come through uh, this month and, and into February, uh, how, that, how that changes if we stay with that, that ratio of uh, half of the amount of total precipitation on the valley floor. Of course, that's good for Ojai because most, if not all, of the uh, of the recharge comes from that top of the funnel, the where the precipitation is the highest. And this is, of course, one of the wetter periods uh, and wetter locations uh, in the county. <coughs> so, what does that do to the groundwater basin? Um, we, as you know, take a look at, uh, at several wells in detail. Here's a water level hydrograph uh, as directly read off of the Elrod well. Uh, so we can really take a really close look, high frequency monitoring of water levels. The 2016 nadir, which is just before this, uh, this logger was starting to read in February 2017, was 265 feet below ground surface that August. Uh, 2017 peak, you remember how wet, especially February was that year, um, is 164 feet, so it came up 100, 101 feet uh, in, that, uh, in that period of time. 2017 dropped down to 190 feet. These are static water levels, not pumping, uh, but at the end of December. Uh, 2018, uh, 182 feet, so it came up only eight feet net. Uh, we'll talk a bit about why. Uh, 2018, the deer of 204 feet. The actual date uh, was in the middle of November. Uh, of course, we know that exactly because we're monitoring these water levels every, every three hours or so. 
Now, we're getting rain, we're getting lightning, and we're getting precipitation. Boy. So what's going to happen in 2019? That peak is to be determined. And if the patterns continue, we've got, uh, we've got reason to be optimistic uh, because the water levels, every time we measure them, are, are higher uh, this time of year. And wells are starting to have that exhale feature where compressed air above, a, uh, above the water table within the well is squeezing up and squeezing out via vent tubes and small holes or crevices in the in the well heads you can feel it in, in physically in some of the wells when the when the re recovery rates and the recharge rates are the highest on the longer term picture uh, this is where we are um, <clears throat> as of yesterday uh, we're at 191.93 feet below ground surface in this Elrod well uh, the key well area near Karn and Grand uh, that's up from 204.55 feet at the nadir 2018. Uh, just for comparison we've got a couple of other uh, other data points there the recent historic <laughs> low of 265 feet in august of 2016 and the more recent high of 164 feet uh, in june 2017. what does that mean as far as storage goes uh, we're just at about 60% basin capacity right now with somewhere around 48,000 acre feet. Of course, by the time I, uh, it was a little bit less when I started this sentence and it'll be a little bit more as I finish it because things are changing that fast. Precipitation response. Uh, last year, the rain total for the whole year, that's October 1st, uh, 2017 to, to September 30th, 2018, was 11.43 inches on the valley floor. Now, in 2018, owing in large part to the Thomas Fire, we had more debris in the creek channels, higher intensity rains, and less overall precipitation to date than this year, the 2018 and 19 water year. So by comparison, the, that rise in static water level in 2017 to 18 was eight and a quarter feet. That's from December 2017 to May 2018, so just about five to six months. This year, the rise in static water levels from November the Nadir to January 30th was 12.62 feet with only 9.07 inches of rain. It sounds pretty good because it is. A couple things are happening. One, the precipitation patterns are much more gentle relative to last year. Uh, they're much more spread out. We're getting obviously more rain to date, but I think we're starting to see the culling out of a lot of the fine grain material along San Antonio Creek in the recharge areas for this basin, which bodes well. We're starting to see it in other basins. Uh, this one, we're liking the response. What does that mean? Uh, as of 3 p.m. yesterday when we took these photos, you can see just a nice good amount of flow going all the way across the basin, which you'd actually expect after receiving upwards of, of 12 inches uh, of precipitation. We're a little bit ahead of that, uh, owing in some part to the clogging, but it's certainly less than, uh, than in previous years, namely 2017 to 18. Now that creek's flowing across the basin, but I love this photograph because it almost looks like 1955 when the Water Conservation District could work in this channel. This is upstream on San Antonio Creek from, uh, from Grand Avenue Bridge. Uh, but it looks like a very nice channel, appears to be naturally cut and of relative clarity. So it's actually losing flow through this section and recharging the basin as opposed to last year when it was skimming across the top. And that's why we have the 12, almost 13 feet now of, of groundwater level response in the Ojai Basin with just nine inches of precipitation versus eight feet with 11 and a half last year. Make sense? Sure. But San Antonio Creek uh, going over the bridge on 33 was high mark to high mark. Yeah, it's, it's pretty today. intense down there. Yeah, it is. Well, even this today is. Yeah, this, is, this looks totally different. I don't different. know if you've seen it. Hence the footnote, as of 3 p.m. January 30th, <laughs> 2019. Uh, that's before the, the, the peaks here that we had. Now, what's interesting is, as, as 
we were coming up here. You mentioned down at the confluence in 33 Bridge. The uh, I, I was talking with the USGS uh, field monitor guy who was who was doing his rating shift manual measurements at the Casitas Vista Bridge uh, this afternoon, and they do that to check the automated gauges that they have on those creeks and that river. And what was interesting is that you know the total the total peak of the flow today is about half of what it was the preceding storm. We're getting a lot more infiltration happening uh, in the headwaters and, and of course less intense precipitation, but uh, it's nice to see that there were th things are starting to trickle in. We're still seeing a lot of debris in the, uh, in the channels and still seeing a lot of uh, deposition uh, as suspended loads are lost to the to the bed load, and that that is the cause of the plugging, but it's heading in the right direction. So that's what we're hopeful for. That will continue. Are we diverting yet at uh, the uh, SAS group? Not that I, I know of. I have a report on that. Okay, thank you. John has a report on that. <clears throat> Okay, um, this is another report for the Basin Status Reports. Z. Right, John? I actually have got it under uh, nine, nine I. Spreading grounds. Got it, okay. Then we'll move on. Anything else? I can give it to you now. If you want. No, that's okay. I want to wait. Okay. Uh, Jordan, anything else? Thanks. Uh, item six is public comments on items not appearing on the agenda. Uh, is there anyone who would like to address the board on, item, on an item that's not in the agenda? No one's raising their hand, so we're going to move on to consent items. Uh, in the consent items, we have item A, which is approved minutes from December 4, uh, 2018. I apologize that the minutes are not in the um, agenda. They're not completed, and I'll present them at the next board meeting. Okay. So we're going to move on to item eight, um, action items. The first is the treasurer's report, uh, which I've had a request to pull for some discussion. Um, apparently... We don't know, or someone doesn't know, where the uh, concept of your Christmas bonus came from. Can we get a little um, explanation about that, please? Um, the concept? Yeah. Did the board uh, approve it? The president did. The president did. See, it, that's, a, that's a problem because of something we call... Um, gift of public funds. Um, uh, Peter, you want to elucidate, please? Or if you don't want to elucidate, do something. <laughs> California Constitution, Design, California Constitution uh, prohibits the gift of public funds. There's an exception uh, if it is for a public purpose. Um, Bonuses are often considered for a public purpose uh, because agencies need to compete with the private sector in terms of attracting and retaining employees. So um, it, it, it looks like, uh, it, you know, the bonus is probably okay. There's another provision of the California Constitution that we also need to look at. But uh, the hope was to just explore the basis for the bonus you know, when did it start? How was it authorized? Just understand the facts and circumstances yeah. behind that, and then just, you know, make sure that we're all on solid grounds in terms of that. That's all. Um, okay, now that you've reminded me, I, it was something that was voted on with, I, I received some vacation time, which I will get that information and present it okay. along with the, the bonus. It was approved by the board. Shall we bring that back and have a look at it? Or what? 
Yeah, I think we'd, the, it would be a good idea for the board to look at that and just understand, you know, if, if, if there's a policy in place, is it, was it a one-time type of situation? Does it happen every year? Just, you know, understand it so we can make sure that, it, you know, everything is copacetic and legal. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Next, right. next month. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the treasurer's report is at 8A. Do we have any comments apart from the bonus? So we have an ending balance of 107, 123.73, correct? Yes, at the end of December. Uh, the budget, John, do you want to answer that? Well, the board has not approved in the budget. Uh, we've, we've had two attempts to get a committee meeting together, and the board president's not been available. So tonight we've got on your agenda a budget for you to take a look at and approve. And I put, put together a spreadsheet and columns and gave you last year's. I gave you uh, a projection for this year and what the... Um, cost of service analysis look like when I put it together a couple of years ago. And so that's a separate agenda item. So at the time of this report, um, <clears throat> I only had budget 17, 18. Mm -hmm. That's why that's in there. Is the action that we're approving the uh, payments or the expenditures, uh, or just simply receiving a report to say where the expenditures went? What do, what do we have here, John? You said you had a budget. Is that the budget actuals that we're looking at? Well, the next page after the disbursements, uh, sorry, next two pages, shows you the budget actuals for first three months of this this budget year. However, since you haven't adopted a budget, um, we did put an item on the agenda to, to attempt to get you to adopt a budget under 8, 8B, which is the next item. Um, they didn't, it didn't take into account the actuals specifically here because it was, ba well, actually it did because I looked at last month's actuals and then I looked at the, um, cost of service analysis and so this spreadsheet that falls under a B is to give you what what we what the budget was for 1718 what we actually spent for 1718 the cost of service analysis estimate that I had done two years ago and then what we I looked at those numbers and then just kind of ooch these numbers enough to say that well this is roughly what we think the draft budget AB. should be for 1819 coming up to that But, but what Ms. Vanderveer has been doing is, absent a budget, she's still been tracking the expenses for each month. And we've done that for the first, essentially the first quarter of the budget year without a budget. <laughs> but at least it's information you have and we're showing you where those expenditures are. Okay. I would, I would suggest that we just receive the report and we can approve the payables at the next meeting when we have a chance to take a look at. Yeah, when it made, uh, makes a little more sense. So can we uh, budget, uh, put this on for the next meeting, please? The budget. Um, item 8B. Yes, please. Bryce? Yo. I just have a question on the, on the budget actual item, line item number 8. 
$1,750. Are you, uh oh, you're on the budget actuals, okay. Tell me again which line, Larry? Eight. Roger just said I, I moved to the wrong budget. I, I'm looking at budget actuals 2018 to 2019. Yeah. That's that's last year's. We're move okay. if you if you move a couple of pages further in your in your packet, you'll see item eight B, which is the draft budget for uh, fiscal years 2018-19. That's where we are right now. Okay. Apologize. No, no sweat. So we're discussing the draft budget now? We are actually getting ready to move it to next month. Well, no, that was 8A. Oh, you want to go back to... No, I, we're done you? with that. I, we're <laughs> ready to go to 8B. Well, that's going to be for next month, right? No. No? That isn't what you wanted? No, all I said is 8A, uh, we can accept the financial report but not approve the payables until we get the information that was requested. Oh, okay. So next month we'll get some uh, real clarification well, on... Between now and then, yeah. Between now and then, right? Okay. You understand that? Mm -hmm. Okay. What about 8B? You guys want to tackle this? Well, I was on the budget committee that never met, so... <laughs> <laughs> I tried. You tried. I tried. So I, f I finally called John and I said, why don't you and CC put together a draft because I don't think we're going to get anywhere. <clears throat> okay. I've... Um, you reviewed it? Well, I have, yeah. It, in the world that I've worked in, budgets are a big deal. So working without one I don't think is a very good idea. It's and we're not a good idea. Already going to move a third of the way into the fiscal year without one. Yeah. So I don't know that this, this is probably sufficient to get us through. What I would like to suggest is that, and I would be willing to support this budget on the, on the condition that for next year we have uh, John and CC prepare the draft budget. I don't think the board committee is a good way to do it because we don't have all the numbers and stuff. So if the, if the staff would develop a draft budget for the June meeting for our review, that way we have time to talk about it, we can add and subtract or whatever we have to do, and then bring it back in July or August with any revisions and have it adopted in sub no later than September. Um, because it really isn't good practice to operate without a budget. It's certainly unfair to the staff. I mean, they technically don't have any approved uh, money to spend. So That's right. I think it, that way we have time to look at it. The other thing is, is I prefer to have a lot of detail rather than just the single. I mean, this can be a roll up, but I like to know if we have a contract for professional services, what the hourly rate is, how many hours we anticipate we're going to use, if there's a contingency, how much that contingency is, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I think John knows what I'm talking about. So anyway, I, I, would, I would make a motion to adopt this budget with that condition. And I think that sounds reasonable. Uh, we don't want to shut down here. No. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, we don't have a problem with it. <laughs> we just no, keep, we just keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. we have a motion and a second. Will you call the roll, please? Oh, did we get a second? I'm sorry. I don't think so. Okay, I'll second it. Okay. The, 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 you're right, now you're basically it. saying that, that, that uh, the condition is, is that we impose a uh, budget calendar. Yes. Yeah, yeah okay. okay. Uh, Director Hages? Yes. Director Johnston? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I choked on that one. Director Ayala? Yes. Director Thilke? Yes. Thank you. That'll keep the checks moving. All right. Item 9, 9A that we go into.
Before, yeah, before we yeah. leave that, I got to just make the inquiry. Uh, Peter, you're sitting in for uh, Dan right yeah. now, yeah. right? And uh, and Dan was on the budget committee that never met because of conflicts in his schedule. Uh, is there uh, hope at the end of the tunnel that his schedule will improve? So I, I did talk to him. He said yes. Oh, okay. He didn't tell me when, though. I forgot to add that to the. That's okay. Um, I'm the vice chair. I'll take over. Um, item 8B. Yeah. No. First C. First aquifer uh, extent investigation. It's a the handout that you have right here. This is a new one. Oh, okay. This one. Okay, this is obviously from Cure Groundwater. Sure enough. Jordan, you want to um, tell us what this is about? Sure. This is a uh, brief proposal as requested to conduct a delineation and uh, beginnings of a feasibility study to do something about the perched area, uh, the perched aquifer system, uh, which based on data from San Antonio Creek and the elevations of discharge within that and uh, the depths to water in the production aquifers uh, within the basin, there seems to be that disconnect. And what we'd like to do is really get a good handle on the extent, nature, lithology, lateral continuity, degrees of saturation, things of that nature uh, of the perched aquifer system. So what we've done is put together this relatively brief uh, proposal. It's something that uh, you've seen components of it uh, before. I'd give you a chance to look over it if you hadn't, but I'll highlight some of the key, uh, the key points. Uh, based on our observations, there's a handful of items that we've uh, delineated within the groundwater management plan to really quantify the phenomenon of, of disconnection. Uh, and really, uh, the projects that can be put forth include uh, continued and enhanced surface water monitoring in the discharge area, which we're doing on a monthly basis when there's a, uh, when there's a disconnected flow in the surface. Not now, obviously, it's all the way across the basin. Uh, Installing a new series of depth-specific or depth-discrete monitoring wells in the perch dock for area and deeper production zones. Um, increasing the frequency of daylighting groundwater mapping from the monthly periods that we have now. Uh, putting down probes and new bores to correlate existing subsurface data in the perch dock for areas. Uh, conduct additional water level monitoring with data loggers and flow gauging uh, in the discharge points of the basin so that we can quantify those flows rather than just monitor them laterally. But the perched area delineation is going to be the first and most cost effective step in the perched aquifer study, really knowing where it is, how laterally extensive it is. Uh, it's effectively project component A from the depictions within the OBGMA groundwater management plan that are shown in the figures uh, right. in the second page here. Um, project components notes correlating existing well data, that's effectively the delineation of this aquifer. Monitor discharge of creek flow, depth specific monitoring wells, perched area recharge projects, and perching layer limits. The, the point is to review existing subsurface data. These are from groundwater production wells, environmental borings, geotechnical borings, in some cases uh, excavations. Uh, that will help us identify the nature and extent of the perched aquifer system. And then by conducting the paper study portion, we endeavor to delineate the extent of the perched aquifer correlating its strata across the salient portions of the basin. Our estimated cost for this at the end, uh, we've earmarked about $4,500 for this over a two to three month period uh, to, so we can generate uh, maps and cross sections and provide a supporting memorandum that uh, we can present at a future board meeting so that we have an idea of very clearly where the extents of this, this per stock for system is. Roughly where, roughly, where do you believe it is? So on the second, uh, on the second page, the top figure mm -hmm. is 
an estimated northern extent of the perch dock for the way this printed out is a little bit blurry, but there's a, a dashed line in the middle of the basin there. So it's, the, it's effectively the southern half of the, the city limits area uh, that are within the basin. Okay. And uh, what we attribute that to is oh, the okay. distal portions of the alluvial fans that make up the, the bulk of the basin sediment have fined and those have been either lacustrine in, in, uh, in nature when San Antonio Creek was dammed up with landslides or Santa Ana Arroyo Prieto Fault shifted upwards, creating a, a down dropping of the Ojai Valley itself relative to the mountains to the south. And within that capacity, you have evaporites, high, high salt bodies. You have uh, very fine grain, low energy depositional environments. Those clay strata have now acted as low permeability units that are perching higher energy depositional environments, sands and gravels above them. And those are the perched aquifers that we're trying to target. Mm. So that is this the western canyon or valley, is that Stewart Canyon? So that, that would be up toward the Arboleda and on the western side of the basin. So, so those big concrete drains that go under the city go over top of this perched? Yes. Okay. And there may be some connection yeah. to, to warrant there. The, the idea of, of having this mapped is key because that, that uh, dashed line that I jogged in was really based on a, a, a fluvial geomorphic model conceptually rather than much data that we really haven't yeah. sunk our teeth into. I will note that the, uh, the northern portion of that, uh, of that arm of the basin uh, probably has a little bit less of the perched system other than just boulders on top of bedrock. And so as it goes to the north, we can extend that line out and better delineate it in that direction as well. Okay. So the um, depth discrete monitoring wells be in the southern portion of the, of the basin. Do you have some idea how many and where? So this isn't the depth specific or depth discrete monitoring wells are not part of this specific okay. uh, project, but um, or this subtask. Some of the locations that we're considering are at the Hanson Yard, right near the OBGMA offices. Um, that's that's one. I know they would be willing to drill a well on their own property and and uh, probably do it relatively inexpensively uh, for that. Uh, we're also looking at some others that are within city limits and in various portions, but we want to really nail it down with respect to <coughs> making sure we can have depth specific wells part of the nest in the perched aquifer system. So delineating where that is will help us elucidate the locations. Unfortunately, I didn't get to make it to the Ventura River Watershed Council today, but Kevin Delano uh, was going to make a presentation. Did anybody go? Did he talk at all about the, the um, uh, gauge that they were going to give us for a couple of years? Yes. He did? Yes. Hey, what did he say? To fund. <laughs> yeah, this is the one at Skunk Ranch yeah. Road Bridge near the, near the uh, discharge point of the basin. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, what else have we got here? Well, that's fairly inexpensive. Um, uh, pleasure of the board. Before the board sets any kind of motion, I do have a question for Jordan. Is this amount within the proposed budget authorization that we put together and discussed with you the other day, or is it in addition? So I just, the board needs to know if we're going to spend more money than we're That's putting in the budget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the way that we tend to operate is we have our, our annual budget, more or less, and we go higher or lower than that on, on certain 
uh, certain mm -hmm. months. Typically, uh, when we have a specific task like this, it's within the, the annual amount. So we're not asking for more money for this specific. We just want to make sure that it's clear <coughs> the budget actions that we're undertaking within that larger umbrella. That's good. One double, thing I would suggest down. is you know, <clears throat> adding a line item to the uh, draft budget specifying this. I think it's good for us to highlight when we do something, uh, something like this. I mean, this is really the only kind of things we can do, so we should make sure that it is uh, pointed out in our budget and highlighted so if anybody asks if we're doing anything, we can show them. And we cannot do that without saying anything because it's in the budget. They can read it, right? Well, yeah, it's there. And All right, pleasure of the board, 4,500 for more information about the basin. I'll make a motion to approve it. No, second. We have a motion and a second. Can you call the roll, please? Director Hedges? Yes. Director Johnston? Yes. Director Baggerly? Yes. Director Ayala? Yes. Director Filkey? Yes. <clears throat> okay, discussion items uh, on nine, uh, item 9, 9A is Groundwater Management Plan Objectives. This is a memo brought to us by Director Hedges that needs to be corrected for spelling there. I don't have any clerical help, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's not yours, that's ours. Oh, it's um, yours, oh. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, you want to go over this? Yeah, I, this was another meeting or part of the budget meeting that Dan and I were supposed to uh, go over some of the uh, actions we might take to achieve some of the objectives in our basin plan. So uh, Dan was unavailable, so I thought, well, at least I'll give it a, give it a shot at some minor things that, that I've found that w I think would be helpful in understanding the uh, not only for the board, but for the general public to understand the basin. And, and in looking at this is from your groundwater management plan update, this chart, this is the one I referenced, this table. Uh, I've had a lot of questions myself, and then I've had a lot of questions of uh, others that, uh, yeah, and I just look and I gave you the wrong table. You I'm did. sorry. This is two, not three. Yeah. Anyway, it's the wrong table. The one I reference shows how much water was used um, over the basin in different capacities. It has total irrigation water. We have uh, total water pumped by private pumpers. We have total water delivered by uh, Casitas and total water used. Oh, thank you. Total water extracted by Casitas. The table has Golden State, but it's now Casitas. And then total estimated groundwater extractions. The questions I get is, well, how much water is used on the basin? Well, the numbers are, the values are there, but you have to do the math to figure it out. And uh, if you look at the graph that that has developed from this table, if you just look at it briefly, it looks like you know, right now we use about 6,600 roughly acre feet. Well, it's much, it's more than that because that isn't really uh, the total, it doesn't add them up. So all I've suggested is, is that we add some things to this. Uh, one of them is the total water delivered to Casitas Community Facilities District. And I think Russ, or I think this is from Russ, provided this year's uh, totals. Uh, the total amount of water uh, uh, pl plus groundwater used in the community services district because there's a lot of interest in how much water is residential water particularly is used in that area and how much we've conserved and it's if you look at this table it's pretty significant when I was doing the work on Ojai flow Golden State was uh, producing about 1,700 acre feet a year and buying three to 500 acre feet from Casitas and now we're down to 1,200 acre feet of groundwater and looks like about 300 acre feet of Casitas. So it's been a significant reduction. 
uh, the total water demand and then come up with a column that has the total water demand over the basin. So you add up all the groundwater plus all of the casitas water delivered. So we have, if we're going to start talking about conjunctive use, we really need to understand that, how much casitas water is actually delivered over the basin. I've heard people say that they don't, they, they don't believe it's very little when in fact it's fairly significant. But it's getting better. We're going to try to get it down to zero. Yeah, well, it's better. It's better, but it's percentage-wise, percentage-wise, it isn't. I mean, it's it's increased actually percentage-wise because there's been such a reduction in pumping. Uh, we're at about 50-50 right now. Mm -hmm. So, the other thing is, is the column B has estimated irrigation demand, and which is basically all of the water less Golden State or Casitas, or the service area of a Golden State. And I think the intent was is try to give some idea of how much water is used for agriculture, at least an estimate. There's pretty hard to get an exact. But it, that's kind of overstates how much water is used for agriculture because we s the uh, two parks, the golf course and the park, are pretty big users, so that might be something to look at to take that out of that number and uh, uh, get us a, get a better idea of the, what proportion what portions used for agriculture versus uh, municipal and and uh, residential uses that was that was the only it, it's it's a minor thing but it gives us a tool and everybody's using the same numbers I, it's really difficult when people have a, a different different uh, idea of what's what's going on the other thing is in just my casual observation, I've noticed there's a lot of uh, fairly large parcels of land over the basin that have been fallowed, and trees pulled out. I don't know why, what they're going what they're going to do with it, and quite a few uh, new orchards, uh, replacement orchards, put in. And so to keep up and have an idea of what the potential future demand is, I, I think maybe we could do an estimate of what those lands would what kind of demand those lands would have in the future, assuming that they plant something similar to what's, what else is growing in the basin. That way we're not surprised one day when the, when the demand start rising. And then the other item was stream flow, uh, which, you know, Jordan is going to do some work on right now. And what I was suggesting is, is if there is existing data, historical data, that we can start to put together to give us some idea of what the correlation is between the groundwater level in the basin and stream flows in wet and dry seasons. Uh, with this adjudication action by the city of Ventura, um, it seems to me that we don't have a problem with overdraft, but it's pretty unreasonable to assume that we're going to keep the basin full and overflowing constantly to satisfy some downstream user. So, so the fl those flows have historically gone downstream with basin at various levels. And so developing some kind of a rough correlation at least gives us an idea of where we're at on that. I know we don't have a lot of stream data, but we have the confluence and certainly have groundwater level. And, uh, and all of these things help us with our objectives. I mean, it helps us in understanding the basin. It, it encourages uh, the supporting activities such as conjunctive use by helping people understand how Casitas and the basin interact. So I think those are things that can help the board and help the, the uh, pumpers understand uh, what, our, what we're trying to achieve. And then the final one, uh, management plan objective number five is administrative efficiency. And I've just suggested that most of us, except for Russ, are pretty new here and we really don't know how things work. So I think uh, it's, it's healthy for an organization to review its uh, financial control policies on a regular basis. And I think there's an item on the agenda to talk about that. So that's all I had. That sounds really good. Um, maybe you can pass that back, Johnny. Because Russ doesn't have a memory without this thing. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh -oh, um, can I suggest that? <laughs> can I suggest that we have a look at what table number three 
looks like with your three new columns and bring it back next month. The stream flow issues, um, well, before I go to there, um, Emily, um, how much is agriculture going to change? Do we need to uh, look at that now or just wait until um, they tell us how much they're going to use? It's so hard to predict. I mean, agriculture in the valleys changed significantly in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to people from the 50s, it's changed a whole lot since mm -hmm. then. Yeah. And it's going to keep changing. Um, there's some big properties that are going to change hands as people pass away. Um, you know, it's hard to predict, but it's easy to, you know, we're going to likely grow tree crops unless we go to greenhouses. Um, just because our soils are rocky and, you know, f anywhere from two and a half to four acre feet kind of the per acre for tree crops is average. I mean, if you could put that across the number of acres. And we don't have anything, agriculture. we don't have anything to do with that. I mean, you can yeah. talk to my counterparts over at Casitas about that, but the groundwater is yeah. not, not going to uh, be involved in your per acre but you can get a rough idea of use, you know, acres of land and agriculture times 2.5 acre feet and get a rough yeah. idea of what we need. Right. Uh, of course, that goes up yeah. uh, during drought periods and goes down on a year like hopefully yeah. this. Um, <laughs> the okay. other thing I would add to that table, there are some significant uses of, um, of surface water that um, you know, Thatcher School has, and Topa Topa Ranch, there's some big users of um, Hermitage Ranch. Um, and the, as surface water dries up, those guys go on to alternate sources of water, either pumping or casitas. So, um, you know, there's... Where, where would it fit? I just added in as an alternate, you know, it's not huge in terms of... But it, it would be a few hundred acre feet a year of... It, again, it, depending on stream flows and how long the streams flow. Um, but it's water being used that on dry years, those people are sourcing from casitas, mostly. And well, wouldn't that show up in the importa importation of uh, water from casitas? Yeah, which would go down on wet years. I mean, it has to be. Demand. The, you know, I estimated I irrigation demand, and that excludes Golden State yeah. purchase. I don't know. Well, um, the other thing I thought of is, you know, you know it's kind of along that line is, is <coughs> there are those additional sources to the basin yeah. that meet demands from surface flows. I mean, Peter Senior Canyon has some, and so those are additional sources. They are. Uh, that help meet the demand. So, with if we have enough information on that, or they're large enough to make a difference, it'd be worth putting them in there. So, external sources. Mm -hmm. Well, if Casitas has their way, we're going to have plenty. Hmm? We're going to have plenty of external sources pretty soon. Yeah, but I, I'm just talking about trying to get a handle on the demand and the supplies yeah. over the yeah. basin. Let's have a look <laughs> at it. Yeah. And. You know, everyone that has a surface water right is reporting to DWR, and that's public information. It's not very up to date, but uh, <laughs> it is on DWR. Yeah. Um, uh, I actually, the the water you're talking about water rights. Yeah, I mean you report the state to board the then. state board yeah. once should, a year. Yeah, it should be the Division of Water Rights, and there you should make a filing every year. So yes. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I just looked at the website, so I'm not good with acronyms. Okay, uh, uh, so we're going to have a look at uh, expanding Table Three to include um, these new uh, additions, and we'll bring it back next week for the stream flow. I hope you'll be patient with us while we uh, work through our um, uh, things that we've got working in the groundwater management plan. But it's they're in there. We know we have to do them. Okay. Yeah, I know they're in there. I'm just saying this is one small part of it that I'm not ex expecting to have this at the next meeting. But thank goodness, I think if there is data available where you can draw some correlation between groundwater levels and stream flows, 
it would give us an idea where we're at. Yeah, the the yeah. graph that you've described and I've sketched out here really includes three components. Uh, it includes precipitation mm -hmm. via a cumulative departure curve or bar graph of precipitation. It includes stream flow either as a daily average CFS at the confluence for which is the most easily accessible data uh, today and uh, and groundwater levels. And if we can plot those three parameters over time and see how they correlate, it's often a very good indicator of the health of all three. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Um, Richard has uh, made these suggestions and we've talked about them a little bit. My question is, um, how do we bring them to the point where we actually vote on something? Do they need to be somewhat uh, laid out, quantified, um, spelled out as far as what's going to happen, who's going to do it? Like how is next meeting we meet and what are we going to do? Look at these and say, well, it sounds good. Should we try to, I don't know. Um, it seems like we, there has to be some kind of a mechanism in place for taking these and, and voting on them and putting them, you know, may, if, they're, if they're good changes, let's make them. I'm not sure exactly how that works. Who's going to, is uh, John, you know, John going to do that? or? Uh, I'd like to suggest that we'll, we'll put a table together and kind of let you work over that. Okay. And then I think once we kind of agree on what that table is going to look like, the next step is saying, what's going to be the effort to get this information together so that in, in ongoing fashion so we can keep you updated? And the board should vote on that, I, I believe. Right. You should sure. vote on the updated table, and then it will be included in the groundwater management plans every year in, the, in our updated DWR. That's right. So does that sound okay? That sounds what I was looking for. Okay. Um, well, this is pretty amorphous the way it is now. And basically, I would uh, I'd like to see something concrete as far as what it's going to look like and how it's, yeah. who's going to implement it. Sure. We're going to boil it down. You'll, it'll, it'll be um, something we can vote on before. Yeah, if Jordan could bring, you know, an estimate of the level of effort it would take to put that other item together. Uh, and if we think it's in, in you recommend it's worth doing, then we can go ahead with it. Exactly. All right. Uh, we will move on here to the 9B, which is the water meter installation requirements. And you have an old. Yeah, and I'm sorry. I apologize. There's actually, um, and Peter helped remind me of this, Ordinance 8 was in your agenda. The last agenda you had resolution 2015-2. Yes. I think that's what I was. And then there was Ordinance 10. So you started in meters in, in 2010 and talking about requirements. 2015, I think it was, when Ordinance 10 was adopted, it, it kind of set the policy parameters of really dealing with meter installation. And then the resolution that we handed out to you tonight um, really defines how we implement that policy. And so the reason this is before you tonight is because a conversation that I had with Director Hages um, over the last few weeks, um, he was saying, well, it's fine to do all this stuff, but how are we going to implement it? And that resolution that was done, we put it together, it had some dates and timelines in it, and we didn't follow up with that, and we didn't implement everything. So um, <laughs> I guess I'd like to, Richard, I know you got some comments, and, yeah. and I'll well, look at that. Yeah, thanks, John. I, I just don't think it's a good idea to set rules and regulations that are essentially law and then not enforce them because you put the pumpers and the organization in jeopardy. You know, you're you're essentially breaking the law by not complying, and we're not doing our job by not enforcing it. And there's some real technical problems with trying to enforce this meter testing program. So I would suggest that we temporarily suspend that test program requirement and instead do what we talked about last board meeting and get the find out when the Golden State now Casitas wells were tested and what the results of those tests were if they haven't been and and uh, we also talked about selecting a few large users or large meters well, not necessarily large meters but I would say large users it's the amount of water that flows through the meter not really how big it is but uh, Soul Park Golf Course is one of them that uh, may be a large one, and certainly it's it's a publicly owned uh, 
facility, so getting the information and getting that tested shouldn't be too difficult. And then if there's others, maybe a couple of large pumpers that would like to volunteer as guinea pigs for this so that we could uh, get an idea of what it, what it would cost to do that. And uh, once we know as kind of a random sample what the accuracy of these meters are, then we can look at whether or not it's cost effective to go forward with everyone being tested. So, but first of all, I, I would recommend that we, that we temporarily suspend this requirement so that these people aren't uh, violating our ordinance and we're not violating our own policy. Uh, how, what is temporary? <laughs> Temporarily? Until we get the results from these large meters that we were going to test to get an idea of, you know, how big of a deal is, you know, the accuracy of these meters in the overall scheme of things. Uh, I mean, to be honest, our ability to estimate how much water is being pumped is, you know, has a margin of error that's fairly large. Um, meter, meters all have a range of, of accuracy. I think the big thing we want to make sure is, is they're not stuck. They're not, you know, so worn from pumping sand and gravel that they're, you know, only registering 50%. So if we could get, you know, even some volunteers to, to do some testing, so we get an idea, kind of a random sample, how accurate the meters are that are out there. If they're in 90, 95%, it isn't worth, not worth spending a lot of money to deal with that. So would this agency be paying for the testing or the individual well owner or entity? I think we, if we can get some people to volunteer and we can find out how much it costs and see what, what we can do. There's a ver variety of ways to do it. If you're trying to test it, <coughs> When you <coughs> excuse me, when you test a meter for, for resale, um, like Casitas does, I mean, they try to get to 98%, 98.5% because, you know, it's a revenue issue with them. Um, the, uh, the range of accuracy of these meters, I mean, I'd tell you the truth, if we, if we get, in, get inside 10%, I think that's pretty good for the kind of meters that are being used out there. The other thing is, is the re when you do one of these tests, these retail tests, they, re they test them from the minimum flow to the maximum flow. So there's tests for this whole range. <clears throat> Most wells pump a pretty steady flow. They don't, the, the flow doesn't vary that much. So that's a much easier test if you simply test it at the uh, typical flow of the meter. So I, I think we just need to do some more investigation of this because, you know, from what we heard last time, and some of this could cost thousands of dollars for each of these well owners, and we're certainly not going to gain their cooperation by having them go out and do that very often. Okay, um, let's see. The, the original intent of the resolution was that the owners would pay for all the testing, and so I think that's a good point that we need, we need to find out the cost of this testing, and it certainly has increased since I was last involved with it. Um, typically, your larger meters. Um, even in the retail sector, public water suppliers, they're going to be less accurate in a shorter period of time than your smaller meters. Your, your house meter is going to be 90% or more accurate over 15, 20 years. But these types of meters generally go out of range of accuracy within three to five years is typically what, what the experience is. So down the road, you know, the agency, it's going to be very expensive to test this, I'm sure, for everybody, whether the agency does it or the property owner does it. Um, and I think that's what Director Hages is trying to find out. What is this going to cost ultimately, and is this the best approach to implement all this resolution? Uh, I, first of all, I don't see a resolution in the packet. This is an ordinance, Ordinance 8. Is no, that, no, that we, correct? I think Ms. Vanderveer had handed out the resolution. You should have gotten one as a handout tonight. Well, and it wasn't in the packet, and we apologize for that. It was in last month's. Right, it's <coughs> resolution 2015-2. Yeah. And it was in last month's board packet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you want us to suspend, um, it? suspend this ordinance, um, resolution. 
suspend the meter, you know, suspend the the mandatory meter testing requirement, and let's say we'll suspend it until July 1st. Okay. So we have until July 1st to get this information back. We just need to make sure that 9B is not 9 ordinance number 8 because that's the body of work that we do and I'm not going to do anything with it. No, I'm just talking about the meter <laughs> testing portion of whether it's an ordinance or resolution. Suspend that specific requirement. Since we're not doing it very well, it's probably a good idea. Does anybody want to move that? Has this ordinance been sent out to all the well owners? Just we did a whole lot of outreach at the time. This was sent out to the well owners, okay. but there's really never been any follow-up. And so what's occurred since that time is owners have been is pretty much voluntarily put in meters. We think most of them have on the new ones that have gone in in recent years. Well, but it, it's a requirement, pardon me, understood. that if they uh, do drill a well, right. they have to have a meter according right. to our yep. no-fee permit so I think are we talking about we're not talking about suspending the meter requirement we're talking about test suspending the, the testing testing, yes. testing and, and calibration and if, and if the board chooses to take that route then we don't have teeth to require somebody to test so it, it's gonna have to be a voluntary system and then we get a, it all boils down to who pays until we bring it back yeah, I would suggest we put a drop dead date, bring it back July 1st so it doesn't just sit out there. I'm going to make a motion. Okay. I'll make I a motion that we temporarily spend the requirement uh, for well owners to test their meters uh, and to make suspend it until July, first meeting in July to give the district or the agency time to research the costs and effectiveness of the testing program. Um, will the maker of the motion um, include calibration? In yes. The, okay, thank you. Do we have a second? Yeah, I'll second it. Uh, okay, second and question. Uh, Go ahead. I, I don't mean to be out of order. Sometimes I am. I apologize. <laughs> I'm wondering if, if July 1st is, 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 is too soon because uh, that's coming up very quick. Should, should we amend that if, if we consider that to, to September 1st? Well, I think if it, if we get some information back on July 1st, then we can extend it. But I don't want to, you know, don't want to let it die. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it won't go back into effect July 1st. It would just come back to us. Yeah. We'll, we'll at least get you some information on the cost then, of testing, okay, what it would and, take to get and that John, done. you're going to be the one to... We'll, yeah, CSAN and I will work together on Thanks, that. Thanks, Larry. Okay. Pull that together. And you're talking about the first meeting in July. Not July 1st. No, the first meeting. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll have a roll call, please. Director Hages? Yes. Director Johnston? Yes. Director Baggerly? Yes. Director Ayala? Yes. Director Thilke? Yes. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. This is item 9C, uh, City of Ventura amended cross complaint, Ventura River. Who's doing this? This is a preamble. The board had asked that this be brought forward at each meeting. Thank you. And so I don't know what kind of report's going to be available, but it's going to be excellent. Uh, yeah, real, real briefly, uh, just to provide everybody an update on the adjudication. Um, I think the big news is that the case is going to be transferred from the San Francisco Superior Court to Los Angeles Superior Court. That'll happen after February 28th. Uh, that's by stipulation of the parties involved. I think it makes sense to get it closer. San Francisco is hard for you know everybody to get to. Um, apart from that, there's going to be a hearing in San Francisco before the new judge that has been assigned to the case. Um, new judge is Judge Masulo. He's the new complex litigation judge for the San Francisco Superior Court. Uh, so now the case has been transferred to him, and there will be a hearing on February 28th to approve the form answer for uh, everybody, all the, def the cross defendants that have been served to, to answer and make an appearance in the case. Um, that is an opposed motion, so the motion will be heard on February 28th. It's opposed by, um, uh, I guess, 
a, a group of water purveyors, uh, Ventura River Water District and Miners Oaks Water District, what? possibly Casitas. I, I, the claim, as I understand it, I haven't reviewed the moving papers or the opposition, uh, but it's basically the, the feeling that before all the pumpers throughout the watershed can be pulled into the litigation, the court needs to make a determination of interconnected groundwater and surface water flow. That, that's what I understand the crux of the opposition is about. Uh, before we go to the, through the monumental task of having everybody served and make appearances in the case, um, uh, actually, I think most people, most, most pumpers have been served, but, but actually you know, have them go out, retain counsel, and make an appearance in the case. Uh, these folks want a determination from the judge that it's, there's actually interconnected ground and surface water. So that's my understanding. There will be a hearing on the 28th. Uh, the judge, Masulo, uh, could very likely push that off because he's not even going to be the judge presiding over this. If it gets transferred to L.A., which it looks like it will, he may very well say, you know, it's not my deal. I'm going to let the, the judge down there decide it. So, you know, it's uh, uh, a lot of moving pieces. Um, it's getting off to a very slow start. Um, it's not unusual. I mean, these things take literally decades. It's complicated ones like this one certainly is. And, uh, I mean, this litigation has been, it was initiated, you know, a number of years ago, and, and uh, it really hasn't even gotten started yet. So, um, it's going to be a long time before many real answers, you know, come about. Thank but you. It's, it's, it's rolling along at a glacial speed, and someday we'll ultimately get resolved. But uh, that's what I got for you. Any questions by the board? Um, and so this uh, new judge in San Francisco who turned the case over to L.A., He's probably going to be taking a vacation in Tahiti, right? <laughs> um, we'll move on to discuss an I discussion item. <laughs> Say again. Uh, yeah, go ahead. What does the WGMA think about them being sucked into it? Any one of these other people that are in the cross complaint, the pumpers, could file for 485 bucks if they get cross complaint against OBGMA. I suppose they could, but we're not a purveyor. I don't know what good that would do them. Um. Right. I mean, anybody can sue anybody, but the whole reason why OBGMA is not a party at this point is because they're not a pumper. The agency doesn't exercise any rights to groundwater or surface water, and uh, as as uh, Russ said, uh, you know, not a purveyor. So um, uh, definitely an interested party, but. You know, not 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 a water right holder or an entity that is is going to assert any water rights either way. We're a water right protector. Yeah, well you have management, or will have, or do have some management authority over the basin, and so that would be an argument, I would think. But if we're left with it, or if we become the water master, who knows? So, so your opinion is it's a low chance. Say again. You never know, Eric. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> 485 bucks, and you know they can sue us. Um, it, it, at some point, the agency is likely going to need to decide whether it wants to intervene in the lawsuit. That's separate and apart from getting pulled in um, as a as a party to the to the action. Um, I, I do think it's probably unlikely that. The agency will get sued, but definitely the agency will need to think about whether or not it wants to become a party and engage in the litigation, given its management responsibilities yeah. over the basin. I think anybody thinking about suing the OBGMA would have to consider what the heck could they get out of it. Um, we're not, we don't have water rights. We don't have, um, we don't have anything to get. So with that, we'll move on to 9D, the conjunctive use agreement. And Jordan and I have got nothing to report yet. It's a little bit more complicated than we thought. So we'll move this to the next agenda, all right? Thank you. 
Uh, 9E is the financial controls policy. Board to discuss policy development and provide direction to staff. This is <clears throat> this was the item I had in my memorandum as one of the meeting one of our goals in the basin plan. Yeah. <clears throat> um, like I said, with the exception of Russ, we're all new, so we really don't know how everything works here. And I think it's important that all of our business transactions are done uh, with transparency and. Uh, an understanding by the public that we're taking good care of their money. The uh, so I don't know if we have a written policy currently. Uh, if we if we do, we can take a look at that. But I would suggest that uh, I talked to John about putting together, drafting up some type of uh, financial control policy and bringing it back to us as soon as possible. The other thing is, is from my understanding from CC, we're supposed to do an audit every two years, and the last audit that I, the last information I have is the last audit we did was uh, for fiscal year 14-15, so we're way overdue, and I, I think there's money in this budget we just adopted to do that, uh, that audit, so I would suggest we do that rather quickly and bring back some uh, proposal from on a from an auditor to do that do we need a motion to do that or just without uh... it's it's almost completed the audit yes there you have it the sixth the one for fiscal year 1617 and 1718 has not started 17, 18, well, it, it's for two years. Mm -hmm. So it, will, it was for 16, 17, no, wait. It was 15, 16, and 16, 17. That's the one I'm expecting okay. any day. The audit. Yes. So we already have a, a, a contract to yes, do we, the audit? Yes. It was approved in, um, I don't know exactly when. I can't say. I can find the, the minutes. And the, um, who signed? It, I, whenever there's um, an audit to be performed, they give us a proposal. Yeah. And it's signed by the board. Mm -hmm. So it, pardon. That's right. Yes. And so it was signed at that time for that audit. And um, I talked to the auditor, and she's. I'm waiting to receive the the completed audit for your review. So it's for 15, 16, 16, 17. You might inquire what it would cost to just go ahead and finish and do 17, 18, because we're already into 19 here. Well, it would be 17, 18, 18, 19. At the end of September 30, 19. And. Um, okay, so we do another one. Yes, the two year, and okay. it's. It's very expensive to do every year. Yeah, no, I, I understand. So that. I th and it's around, I believe, sixty-five hundred dollars okay. for the two-year audit. Okay. So I should get it any day. All right. I know you've been asking for it. And it, and as part of those audits, and I think many of you know that they also, the auditors provide comments about the types of controls and procedures and policies that the agency should implement. And I would have to assume that financial controls has been raised by the auditors in the past. I haven't seen those audits, but uh, mm -hmm. we will certainly follow up on that and make sure that if that's also including the audit, it's another reason to get that done. Aside from the many other reasons, <laughs> you should have that. But we'll, we'll draft up some uh, financial control policies if we don't already have something, and then we'll bring that to the board for your consideration. Okay, fine. Thank you. Um, 9F is water marketing. Uh, board to discuss presentation made to CMWD on water marketing. And it's true. Um, CMWD did have a uh, presentation made by Mr. F forget his first name. Fearhoff or something like that. Fine, thank you, from CLU. Um, and I don't 
don't think there was a whole lot of interest in the concept of, first of all, um, it's pretty much a groundwater, as, as I understand it, it's a groundwater issue. Um, they're trying it on the Fox Canyon groundwater management um, basin. And the concept is that you're given, the pumpers are given X amount of water to um, use on their own. Uh, if they don't use all of that, they could sell the surplus to another pumper within the, within the basin. My problem with that is that ever since the beginning of the Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency, they have been in extreme uh, overdraft. I don't see that they really have legitimate um, surplus water to sell to anybody. If they had surplus water, they ought to be using it um, to bring the basin back up to normal and stop the seawater intrusion and all of those other things. But I'm kind of biased because I've been around a long time. Um, Richard, you wanted to uh, talk about this? Yeah, I can't. I was there at the, was it a committee meeting it was at? Casitas? I don't know where it was. I think I it was your water resource committee. And the, the part I was interested in, if you, is that he didn't go into this at Casitas meeting, but in the last part, he has a proposal to, uh, to connect, connect a well somewhere on Gorman Grand to. Uh, well, you're looking at something from Ted Moore. Oh yeah, what do you, isn't this it? No. Oh, okay. Well, then forget that. Water, water marketing is water right. marketing. It's totally different. Yeah, it's some, sort of a cap and trade or something that they've yeah, got. Right. In, oh. Yeah. They, it, I thought you were talking. Fine up didn't have anything to do with uh, water marketing. The uh, I think that's what it, that is. That may have been my confusion, but no, I sorry. didn't have specific items. But um, I I would like to suggest that the board. I mean, it's, it's interesting information, but considering an adjudication going forward, ultimately that will be something that will probably come out of the adjudication. The San Gabriel Valley, which I believe is adjudicated, has a process such that if a pumper needs additional water, they can get it from another pumper if they have excess. And so I think that's ultimately going to come out of this process, and I think we're probably, based on decades of litigation, probably 20 years too soon to be discussing this. <laughs> Well, um, one question is, is our legislation uh, going to remain intact throughout this um, adjudication? Because it has, it has a lot in it, a lot more than the Fox Canyon uh, initializing le legislation. The court does not have any power to alter the enabling act that was adopted by the state legislature, you know, creating OBGMA. You know, the court has only the power to interpret and um, and decide issues that come up, you know, with, with regard to, uh, you know, the language of the Enabling Act, but cannot change the Enabling Act itself. So I no, the answer is no. Uh, you know, nothing's going to happen to the Enabling Act. Um, as a result of the adjudication, um, at least not immediately, right? I mean, we could always go back to the legislature and request a change to do whatever, to implement whatever decision the court makes, but, um, uh, you know, I don't foresee that being okay. necessary at this point. Great, thanks. Uh, well, Richard, well, I just I like, uh, go, go, you go ahead. Well, I was we've had a, about we've had a couple of presentations by PWR, yeah. uh, Ted Moore and, and company, uh, about his concept of, you know, doing whatever he wants to do, and he's trying to trying to get Casitas to be a partner. The problem is he hasn't pro provided us with a real business plan. Yeah. We have no idea um, what all it, it it entails, what the uh, short comings are and I, I i don't want to discuss it here no i don't i i don't either i thought it was what you i thought you brought it up no but on as regards no, to, me. to the fox canyon one of the differences between what they're doing in the fox canyon is those pumpers some of them have uh historical allocations 
Well, we haven't done that as far as I know. That does make a difference. So if a, if a well is assigned an allocation and they don't use that water in any given year, then what they're talking about doing is letting a neighbor use it or whatever. So that is a difference. Well, the problem is, though, is that well, I know they have a since problem since 1983, there, they've been in extreme overdraft, and I don't, you know what I mean. Yeah, Never mind. yeah I do. My understanding was that they weren't uh, just allowing them to claim their rights, uh, which have been overdraft in the basin, yes. but rather to uh, proportionately allocate uh, what each uh, person has or each uh, owner, and that uh, it would. Uh, by measuring it and allowing them to sell off that they would then become more efficient, but they would be becoming more efficient with a lesser level until the basin recovers. Whether or not it works, we don't know. The basin has a long way to recover with seawater coming in from the south and, ah well, never mind, that's their problem, not ours. Um, anything else on water marketing? Hope not. Um, item 9G. Alternate demonstration review status. John, this I'll, better be good. Well, I'm not sure it's so good, but I know. Uh, it, it's not bad, but it's <laughs> not, why, not why necessarily did, good information. Well, it's good information. Why um, did we get to put it high for the basin boundary? I, I don't know. and That doesn't make any yeah. sense. Well, that, that wasn't what this report was on. I know, so. but I had to get you first. <laughs> Thank you. Do you know? <laughs> okay, well, we, I spoke on the 14th of this month with a Craig Altier, who's a senior engineer with the Department of Water Resources. And my specific question was to him, where are we at with the review of the alternatives and have you looked at ours? And, and the only information I was able to get from him at that point, nothing in writing, nothing, no committal, no comment regarding they've even looked at our plan, is that they expect to have a complete review of all of the alternatives by late February to early March. So that's what I can report. Of this year? Of this year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, uh, Peter, do you think we ought to develop a legal um, status for um, Sigma recognizing our um, initializing or enabling legislation and the, the um, um, sections of Sigma that apply to that and um, always go back to the original um, thing that uh, both the governor and Sigma said, local agencies know best. Would Russ, I'm good? sorry, I, I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, should we, should we be Which prepared uh, <laughs> legally for um, Sigma to come back and say, nope, you got to do a groundwater sustainability plan. Right, and, and that's a possibility. And, and if uh, the Department of Water Resources rejects our alternative demonstration and we're required to do a groundwater sustainability plan, then we will have to do that under the Sigma statutes and also the power that the agency has through its enabling legislation. So it's pretty simple, I think. I'd like to suggest, is there an opportunity for the board to take any kind of an action that would force DWR to push the requirements of meeting that groundwater sustainability deadline, considering their delay in approval of Sigma? Because we have, we, every day that goes by, we have shorter time to prepare a Sigma plan. Right, the uh, deadlines in Sigma are the deadlines in Sigma. Those are set by the legislature. Uh, at DWR, I'm not aware of any authority that they have to uh, extend the deadlines uh, upon a motion of a party. Um, no, I, I, I think the agency needs to look at this as though, you know, we're going to need to get on it pretty quickly once we hear. Um, I don't want to cave. If, if <laughs> you know, if we do need to prepare a groundwater sustainability plan. You know, the, the elements of such a plan um, are already in our groundwater management plan. They're already in the alternative demonstration that we did, yeah. we'll, you know, need to. But it seems to me we cross that bridge when we come to it, I, you know. And, and uh, 
you know, an opportunity to get some leniency in terms of the compliance deadline from TWR, I mean, it may come up down the road, but um, uh, I think our immediate task would be to get on it and try to get a groundwater sustainability plan done within the deadline. Fun. So that's all you have to report on? Which, which I believe is January 2022. I think that's, that's correct. Yes. <laughs> so we're running out of time. Don't we have two years. Yeah. No, three years at this point. Okay, we're going to move on to uh, 9-H Wildlife Conservation Grant status report. Who's got it? I know, Jordan, I thought you had reported out on this before, that there was some work going on, but, uh, yeah, okay, there we go. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking right at you, come I'm on. Right. <laughs> I, I'm trying to go in order here. You're in order, okay. step up. Give her an uh, order. Uh, April 4th, the, uh, the awards for the Wildlife Conservation Board grants will be awarded April 4th. Thank you. Uh, Golden Globe April. Awards. <laughs> Oh, you haven't got any inside info, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, never mind. Um, can I also add that we are trying to refine the document? Um, so uh, we have asked partners to come in and help us refine it in case it doesn't get funded because there are other, there are other funding sources. Okay. So if there's something else you want to add, um, I'll send in some of those um, Okay, thanks. All right, if there's nothing else on the Wildlife Conservation Grant, we'll move on to 9I, Spreading Grounds Diversion Channel Cleanup. Yeah, I don't have very good news on this. Um, I spoke with Pam Lindsay, who's the Environmental Services Section Manager of the Water Pollution Control, or Water uh, Protection District, and um, sounds like they're in somewhat of a, in my opinion, a disarray over this system. They've, the the former director had brought up at a previous meeting about rocks in the channel that she talked about um, that's my fault I told sediment you. issues that they've had problems with they've had uh, screen plugging they've had problems with they have control systems they have problems with and she says they have no money to fix anything uh oh here it comes yeah so we're on the hook for um, maintenance yeah so well they don't see any I didn't raise that issue okay <laughs> You know, be careful what you ask for. But so it sounds like there, there, there's been no diversion this year other than there may have been some passive diversion. She says some water does get into those spreading basins, but it's more passive than deliverable. Yeah, whatever <laughs> falls from the sky and whatever accidentally gets diverted. Which thus far is 12 acre feet. <laughs> hey. And because of the nature of the ponds, you can go to the the outflow point and see remnants of flow that has gone down the recharge wells uh, but I think it would be it would be we intended to go on a field trip up there to to bring our own shovels and picks and dynamite sticks and uh, take a look at it but I think it's uh, we should be due post this storm to do that well I did I did talk to I'm sorry did you want to Okay. Um, let John let John know whatever you know. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, uh, I had a question, Jordan, because um, I live near San Antonio Creek, below the diversion, the um, settling mm -hmm. ponds, and the channel is rising with sediment. Do are we fearful that you know if we get after this next storm, if we get a 10-inch storm mid-February, is there any fear that we're going to lose the spreading grounds like we did after the 85 fires when they just completely filled with muck from the mountains coming down? I, you know, I don't see anyone cleaning out the boulders right, in the creek right. beds anymore, and they are rising. I, I'll start off by saying that January 9th, 2018 changed my perspective on the power of muck. 
Yeah. But it's it's something that the way the spreading grounds and the diversioning structure are designed, that the likelihood because it's off channel and there's a pretty pretty substantial berm between the main channel and the spreading grounds themselves, mm -hmm. which we should remind are really clarification ponds as opposed to infiltration basins. Those that filled uh, following the 85 fire uh, were on, on or close channel. to grade and on the south or basin side of the of San Antonio Creek and didn't have the berm that, yep. that was built up. So the four the four spreading basins have effectively just become clarification ponds mm -hmm. such that the clearest water is passively injected via the dry recharge wells at the end of that system. So any chance? No. Nature's a mother. But it, it, is it likely? I, I don't think it's likely that a significant storm could, could provide that kind of, of damage. OK. Uh, I did talk to um, Glenn Shepard, director of um, the Watershed Protection District, about the channel at um, the bridge that allows for the water in the stream to hit the gauge, which sets off the ability of um, the stream to, um, yeah, that yeah. one. And he said he would look into it, but it's never easy when you're in a stream doing anything. So I don't know what they're, what they're up to. I just, I worry because, uh, you know, the creek bed's gone up feet in the last, you know, 15 inches of rain since we've had in the last two years. And it can go up fast, as it did in 69. It jumped out on the north end of Fordyce Road and went, it did, in 1969, less water flowed under that bridge than in 2005, because the water wasn't flowing under the bridge, it was flowing across down Gorham Road. The highway, I remember. <laughs> so, Oh, yeah. anyway, I, I, I am concerned about the amount of sediment that's building up fairly quickly. And um, Ojai Water Conservation District was going to write a letter. It's in the process of writing a letter to um, Watershed Protection District asking if there is going to be any clearing of streams if we continue to get five-inch storms. It's, you know. Yeah, good idea. If we go up 10 feet, we're going to have problems. You know, okay. Bocali's restaurant. That Who is, knows which streams are going to fill up? But, um. That is our spreading grounds diversion channel cleanup status report. Anything else by the board? Uh, the item 10 before you are the informational items. Uh, you can pick one to talk about, or we'll move on to item 11. I, I just re, uh, quickly offered a couple page synopsis of the Ventura River study by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. I don't know what the status of this work is. But there's a lot of data here, so I didn't want to print it all out and put it in your agenda. Uh, we'd have to cut down a few trees to do that, I'm afraid. Um, but I think it's good information that board members may want to dig into a little bit, and I'm going to dig in, into it myself a little more. Okay, good. Um, where, are your, is, where are your gloves? This is a Ventura River study, <laughs> one of about 30 that's, yeah. that's going on. Yeah. <laughs> Which this includes in San Antonio Creek, as they call a primary tribu tributary. Okay. Uh, John, if you're going to dig in, wear your gloves. I'll see what I can find out about it. Okay. Thank you. And other studies. It is now 20 minutes of 7. Is there anything else to discuss by uh, this board? Just a I'm sorry, the last item, the surface water supplementation, we did provide that to you tonight. Got it. So, no. Is that yours? Thank you. Is there anything from the public? Anybody want to say anything? Anything at all? Come on, Larry, say something. <laughs> okay, I move we adjourn. <laughs> okay, we will adjourn at 20 minutes of 7. Thank you. All right. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Emily. Yeah. Damn.